You're listening to The Table, a podcast series from students at Christian Theological Seminary. Pull up a seat. There is a space at the table for everyone. I'm your host, Francine Dash. Welcome to The Table. So what do you do when the pain is so great that you don't know what to do? When my mother died in November of 2021, November 7th, in fact, even though I knew it was inevitable, I still couldn't believe it. I mean, I prayed and I thought that maybe God would give me what I prayed for, but that didn't happen. The overwhelming pain of loss can cause you to wonder about a lot of things, about life, about people you know, people you love, about God. And nothing prepares you, not only for the grief, but for this wondering that takes place. I wondered a lot, sometimes to myself, sometimes out loud, sometimes in the middle of the grocery store. I even had to pull over on the side of the road a couple of times just to wonder and cry. So I joined a grief support group. And it was the first time that I heard any mention of healing as a journey toward making peace with the things I couldn't change. The leader of the group was trying to encourage us to basically set ourselves on this journey of healing, but she said, first, you must determine where you want to go. And that stuck with me. And it kind of stung me a little bit because all I could think is that I wanted to go to my mother's house. I wanted to see her standing there with that smile greeting me at the same time, scolding me for not visiting more often. But she's not there anymore. So I want to take you on a journey with me, a journey of where my search for healing has led me. And if you're looking for healing or something else that will make you feel whole or peaceful, maybe you will find a reason to start your journey toward healing too. Our journey of hope has led us to Psalm 130. And our special guest, Dr. Rachel Wren, is not only a Psalm scholar, but is a pastor, an assistant professor of biblical studies at Trinity Lutheran Seminary, and a co-founder of her own podcast, The First Reading. Dr. Wren, thank you so much for making space for us today. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. That's an incredibly powerful story. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go deep, can you give us some insight on the context in which this psalm was created? Boy, I can and I can't. Um, That's the tricky part about being a psalm scholar. Uh, (laughs) A a lot of biblical scholarship is spent of people saying, well, it was maybe out of this context, maybe out of this context. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the psalms, we're pretty much like, maybe. (laughs) But we don't really know. Um, You know, there's a lot of theories that these were created in a cultic context. And I don't mean cult in a bad way. I mean, like, religious, liturgical, especially Mm -hmm. in terms of the temple. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I do think that's one important piece of context. Uh, For a lot of modern worshipers, especially modern Christian worshipers, anytime we read about the temple in the Hebrew Bible, our mind associates that with our church, either our our big church or like especially our little churches, Mm -hmm. which, you know, which makes sense there. It's a place. Um, The difference is that there was one temple um, in the biblical mindset. There was only one physical place where you really went to experience and interact with with God. Um, So when we talk about these things in a cultic temple context, we're we're really talking about Jerusalem. Um, Mm -hmm. We're talking about the center. Um, and, And one other thing that might be important there is that in the temple, uh, there was this concept that uh, metaphysical reality got real thin, um, mm, so that wow. the the world of of humans mm-hmm. and the the break between the world of humans and the the world of the divine, the above world, got really thin and was kind of flexible. Um, and that's why there was only one place that you really went to experience God. Because if you had thinness like that all over the world, the world would be destroyed. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> now, this psalm is not very long. No. Uh, could we perhaps go through it verse by verse and have you give your interpretation of each verse? 
Please. I'd absolutely love to. Um, I'm going to read out of, uh, I believe it's the NIV version. Okay. Uh, so here's, here's Psalm 130. Out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Wow, that is powerful. Of course, when I first read this, I didn't understand any of it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was I was 13 years old, and I was just doing what I was told. <laughs> All this crying and whatnot. So let's let's go through it. Um, let's start out with verse one. This cry at the very beginning seems mm. so guttural, so desperate. Mm. Mm. Why is this emphasis on depth yeah. so important here, you think? Super great question. So a couple of different reasons. Um, and first of all, just to preface that, like the imagery of the Psalms is one of my favorite things about it. It is mm -hmm. vibrant. It is, you know, uh, it draws you in and and it's one of the ways that can be hard to access it, uh, mm -hmm. but it's also one of the really compelling things about it. Um, so a couple different interpretations of out of the depths. Um, you, Your listeners couldn't see my hands earlier, but when I was talking about the world of the earth and the world of heaven, my hands were low on the mm -hmm. earth and they mm -hmm. were high on heaven. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because um, God or the divine beings were pictured as above us. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so their realm was above in the heavens, pretty similar to what we think of right now. Right. Um, but they also didn't have that same sense in, in terms of Christianity of like God with us and Jesus in our hearts and the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit right next to us. Um, mm -hmm. No, God was up <laughs> and far away. And, and so to get God's attention, you had to make a lot of noise. Like you had to offer a sacrifice so that that fantastic scent of barbecue went up to the heavenly nostrils <laughs> and then God looks down and is like, hey, we're gonna get more of that, right? right. Uh, so there is this just sense of like very clear sense of place. As a human, I'm here on earth. And right. so if I want God's attention, I gotta, I gotta get out of this down place. Mm -hmm. uh, but another interpretation is a little bit more of a, a metaphorical one of this, mm -hmm. you know, sense of being in a deep place, a depth um, was dangerous in the ancient Near East. If you were in a dry creek bed, which is below, mm -hmm. and um, and monsoon rains came, you would die. Um, if you were in a below place, a lower place in war, and your mm -hmm. enemy was above you, again, you die. Um, <laughs> if you're put in prison, which in these times, prison was a hole dug in right. the ground, you die. <laughs> so so <laughs> it was a dangerous place to be in the depths. Why is it important for the speaker to bring one's record of sins to God's mm -hmm. attention? I mean, if you're trying to pray for a, a favor or something, why bring up the part of you that doesn't deserve the favor? Yeah, that's no, a great question. Um, so two answers. Number one, because um, because it's just sort of a practicality. Like, mm -hmm. God, if I were coming to you on my own merit, um, you would look at my record and you'd be like, nope, like <laughs> not going to happen. You know, you don't deserve forgiveness. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also this sense of like what it's like to petition somebody of higher status than you. Again, mm -hmm. we've got a little different conception of God. God mm -hmm. is seen as as Jesus, my friend, my brother, uh, more of someone alongside you. Mm -hmm. um, but in the ancient Near East, God was really above you in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, so, so one had to approach the deity with all sense of like obeisance, respect, honor. And one of the ways you did that was by saying like, you know, look, I know I'm a mere worm. 
Um, but could you, in your divine benevolence, pay attention anyway? So there's this mm. sense of that positioning as well. And and not in, I want to make sure, you know, not in an artificial way. Like this wasn't mm -hmm. manipulation. This was really trying to show the due honor and respect that God deserved. You know, in the NIV version of verse four, we heard the word reverence. And in the mm -hmm. Jewish study Bible, we hear the word awe. Yeah. Um, as we're skipping forward, what what do you think is going on here? Yeah, it's different translations of the same Hebrew word. So the Hebrew word is um, yare, and yare also means to fear. Um, mm -hmm. This is also the word in Proverbs where, uh, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, and I don't know if your listeners know this, but Hebrew has, especially biblical Hebrew, has way less words than English. Um, mm -hmm. And so they they have more meanings. They carry mm -hmm. more meanings. And so because of that, in any context, you got to choose one of those meanings to run with. Um, mm -hmm. So this this word can mean, yare can mean fear, as in to be mm -hmm. afraid of. It can also mean um, to be in awe of someone, and it can also mean to honor them. So I think the translators are just kind of choosing different tracks Which there. Ones? Yeah. Do, yeah. Do you prefer one over the other? I was just thinking about that when you said, I think one over the other depends on my depths at the time. No, oh, good way to say it. I, I think the other thing to note about this verse is that um, what prompts the reverence is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's kind of neat that it's not like, I revere you, so forgive me, but mm -hmm. that, you know, even in spite of everything, you forgive me, and that prompts this reverence, this awe, this honoring out of me. So it's mm -hmm. divine action that draws forth the proper response from us. As we move into verses five and six, there's a part of scripture um, that kind of spoke to me as I spoke about my mother. Mm. And it's the part that says my whole being waits. Mm. Now, some translations say my soul waits. And mm. and um, and there's a one translation that says I look or one looks only to the Lord to emphasize yeah. that only the Lord can yeah. address where I am now. This seems like such a serious indication of how important this moment is to the reader as well. Oh, yeah. So much so. I So this, um, you picked up on one of the crux words that I like to talk about, and it's the the word nefesh. One of the things I'm trained in, trained in is the embodied nature of the biblical Hebrew language. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's got less words mm -hmm. and the words carry more meanings, when it's using, um, when it's talking about um, strong metaphors, especially associated with selfhood or emotions, it uses body parts. Um, okay. Nefesh is a body part. Um, and so real quick, um, it's usually translated as soul, which is not a body part. Um, and it's a New Testament idea, but it's not actually a very strong Old Testament idea. Mm -hmm. um, but if you were to say, okay, which body part do you think it is? Which body part did they associate with the soul? The heart is the first okay. thing that popped into my mind. The, uh -huh. Very good guess. Sometimes the, the Hebrew word is lave for heart, mm -hmm. and sometimes mm -hmm. that gets translated as soul too. Um, mm -hmm. That's not nefesh though. Nefesh mm -hmm. is actually right here. It's your, uh, it's your throat. Um, and it's not specifically your speaking throat. That's your garon. That's a different word. Okay. Your nefesh is guttural. It is sobbing, swallowing, breathing, weeping, wow. sighing. Yeah, right? Like, And if you think about it from an embodied perspective, from an ancient society that's concerned mm -hmm. with warfare, mm -hmm. if you get a finger chopped off, you mm -hmm. can survive. If mm -hmm. somebody cuts your nefesh, you are mm. dead. You are done. Right. It, it's not actually soul in the sense of a mortal soul. It's right. a sense of your, it's actually your deepest mortality. It is your deepest humanness that makes you a living, breathing being. Wow. That's what's waiting for God here. So when oh, you were wow. talking about like praying after, um, for your mom not to die or after she died and your whole body being a part of it, like you probably prayed like your life depended on it. Absolutely. Yeah. You prayed like your nefesh was at stake. Wow. And, and that's what's going on here. Dr. Wren, what do you think is the most important part of the scripture for people who may be searching for their answer 
from the depths of their pain. I mean, in some ways, the whole psalm sort of walks through that journey. You know, the last verse is almost you looking back at yourself. You know, right. oh, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Oh, past Francine, put your hope in the Lord. Because yeah. now on this side of the journey, I know, you know, I've experienced that, right. that process. And healing is a waiting. You know, you don't, you don't heal quickly from anything, from a paper right. cut, from a, you know, and then from a loss of someone who is one of your core people, mm -hmm. that requires a waiting. Dr. Wren, thank you so much for your contribution to this podcast. It was such a pleasure, Francine, and you blessed me today with our conversation, so thank you as well. Healing is never easy, and there is no one beautiful way to do it. But I know from experience that the journey is worth it. I'm your host, Francine Dash. Thank you so much for meeting me here at the table.